Mike Varney, yes, um, sure. can you take us back to why you decided to run run the London Marathon in 1981? So at that time, I was uh, working for Tottenham Hotspur as their physiotherapist. And uh, we were on a coach journey going to one of our away games. And there was always a little bit of um, a bit of fun on the coach with, between the players and the, the staff and myself and so on. And I had found out that there was going to be a London marathon. So I put it out there to the players. I said, anybody, any of you fancy running the London marathon? And of course, there was complete silence after, <laughs> after that statement. None of them thought, no, well, that, that's, that's not for us. And then one of them chirped up and said, I bet you couldn't do it. Well, that was the start of it, really. I couldn't resist the challenge. So I said, well, I'll do it as long as you all sponsor me. And that's how it, it got underway, really. So I then entered. Uh, of course, in those days, I think, I think they had 20,000 entries. And I think they only accepted six and a half thousand. And I was lucky enough to get picked. So I had no choice now but to go on and get fit and run the London Marathon. Do you remember doing any training or what was your training, should I say? I trained for probably about 15 weeks before it. Now, prior to that, I had been in the army as an army physical training corps instructor. So I'd always kept pretty fit. And of course, in the army, you tend to do a lot of running um, as part of the sports program. And if you're a physical training instructor, you often take the running and organize cross countries and run in it and so on. So I was used to running, but never that kind of distance. So, and in those days, nobody was really there to advise you on training. Um, you know, there weren't, if you do it today, you're lucky enough to get in, then you've got multiple programs that you can follow by different people. Whereas in those days, you had to kind of sort your own training out. So that's what I did. And I, I did a bit of reading and I decided I was going to try and run absolute minimum 60 miles a week in training. Um, and that's what I did. And that often meant sometimes I would come back from an away game. We'd play in perhaps Middlesbrough um, and we'd come back all sorts of ridiculous hours and I'd get my kit on and go for a run to fit it in. So... It's quite interesting, really. Mm. And what was perhaps your longest run, um, you know, during your training? Did you get up into 20? I started to, yeah, I started to do the, the, the Sunday runs and gradually built those up from about 12 miles. I don't think I ever ran more than about 16 miles in training continuously. So I now realise, looking back, that that leaves 10 miles to, to run, which actually is the worst 10 miles for sure. But there you go. Hmm. All experience. So on the day, what do you remember on the day from getting to Greenwich Park, etc.? Um, well, first of all, I thought it was really exciting. There were so many people up there milling about, most of us not knowing what, what you were supposed to do in terms of where you're leaving your kit because they had it organised that you put it on specific coaches, etc. I thought I'm never going to see I'm never going to see my tracksuit again when I took that off and put it on a, in a bag. Um, and, of course, big queues for the toilet was the most obvious thing. I think most of us found that. And being nervous about the start position, you, uh, you know, you were always wanting to go to the loo before you start actually started. With regard to the race itself, um, I was quite a long way back in the park when the starting, I think, was it a starting pistol or was it a whistle? I can't remember who started it. Um, but... Uh, it started, and of course, what what I hadn't anticipated was it took quite a while to get to the start position, which is where your timing really would have started. So um, after about three or four miles, I looked looked at my own watch, and I'd given myself a schedule, and I thought, "Wow, I'm going too slowly," and I hadn't computed the fact that it had taken me about three or four minutes to get to the start. So I picked up the pace and I paid heavily for that on the Isle of Dogs, I remember, uh, really struggling. But I, I am proud to say that I ran all the way, didn't stop. That's brilliant. And um, so people often say that a marathon is divided into two parts, the 20, first 20 miles and then the last six miles. So was that last six pretty tough? It was pretty tough. I, I got past uh, by one notable competitor on the final run-in 
And that was the New York waiter who was carrying a bottle of uh, uh, fizzy water on a tray with two glasses. <laughs> and he actually passed me on the run in. And I was really disappointed about that. <laughs> but I did subsequently find that he was uh, he was actually a, a very good marathon runner anyway. And he he carried this and he'd done it for sponsorship. What was your time, Mike? I did three hours, 10 minutes, which I was pleased pleased with that. Yeah, for a non-marathon runner, um, first ever marathon, I think if I'd have stuck to it, I'd got under three hours, I suspect, if I I did another one. Certainly wouldn't do that these days, but but at that time, being quite fit, and if I'd have trained a bit more specifically for a bit longer, I might have got under three hours. And did you ever run a marathon again? No. (laughs) <laughs> no, no. Based on the fact that following the, the marathon, the first marathon, um, I think it took me about five days before my legs would allow me to walk up and down stairs properly. <laughs> so stiff, so painful. So clearly not enough training. And do you find as the years go by, people when people say, have you ever done a marathon? And you say, yeah, I ran in the first ever one. You think these days people are like, are, are impressed. Yeah, they often don't have any idea when it started, to be fair. And when you point out it was 1981, it's a bit of an eye-opener for them, really. Mm. So, yeah. I'm 77 now, so I think I'm beyond marathon running, really. All right. Okay. Um, And do you look at, you know, what you do in in sports physio, you know, very, very well known, um, do you look at the mass participation and and celebrate seeing so so many people now going running, not only in the London Marathon, but also you see even the streets of Harlow, especially during this last year, lots of people taking up running. Is that something you're pleased to see? Yeah, I think it's it's really good. And in fact, at the clinic, um, we all, we have a, a marathon day very early on when people know they're in the London, and we follow them through. So if anybody get gets injuries, et cetera, we follow them right through to the to the start of the marathon, um, and often we see them after the marathon when they're recovering from minor strains and so on. So we have a real interest in the marathon runners even today from the clinic. And when you're doing that pre work, what are the type of couple of key bits of advice physically that you give to uh, to uh, runners? I think it is important that they follow a, a progressive schedule. Um, it's very easy to get carried away in the early stages, and that's what often hurts hurts people's bodies. That they do, you know. For instance, we spoke about the long Sunday run. Uh, I think you've got to build up to be able to run beyond, t- say, ten miles uh, at racing pace. And I think that's the thing that you need to be fairly gentle about in in increasing. So you know, maybe just putting one or two miles on per week until you get up to your your target mileage. Okay. And finally, did you keep the medal? Have you got the medal and the... Um, and the I've still got the medal, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I've still got the medal. Um, I've still got, I'm quite proud of it, really. It's a nice little medal. And uh, it, it's it's in a collection along with the... I've, I'm very fortunate to have FA Cup and UEFA Cup medals because, obviously, while I was at Spurs, we won those competitions. Uh, no, I think I didn't... I, I knew you were the physio, um, but I didn't know you would get a medal as well. You must be so... Of all those yeah, medals... No. Which one are you most proud of? No, that's a tough one, really. I mean, obviously, from a personal achievement point of view, the London Marathon was, was one to keep. But also being part of a, a big club, being the, the lead physio and being with the team everywhere they went, abroad and here in, the, in the, this country, being present on the times when they won the FA Cup twice in consecutive years and then the UEFA Cup were huge honours just to be involved with the club and I think those medals mean quite a lot it's a good reminder of what went on I can't help but ask another Spurs question as we're talking about that and I've got you here is is that replay in 81 that must have been a fantastic yeah. night to be on that bench on that night it, it was that was the you're, you're talking about the Ricky Villa one yeah in particular yeah so there's an interesting story about that because, of course, Ricky Villa was substituted in the first game and he trudged off round the pitch, very de- dejected. And um, 
when we all came back into the dressing room, he was literally was sat with his with his head down. And Keith Birkinshaw, I remember it vividly, said to said to him, Ricky, you get your head up because you're starting on the replay. And that was it. Great, great bit of management. Ricky went on and got the winning goal. So the message for for the Ricky Via message and marathons is just don't give up. Never give up. Never give up.